are here on a grand tour, um, uh, taking the method around circularity and the SDGs. Giuseppe Sergi, who is um, a Stern alum and also uh, very active in working with the UN, um, uh, I mean, works with the European Union Association, but has been very active in organizing and bringing um, our colleagues here to speak. Um, so I'm just going <laughs> to get the big one. Okay. Um, <laughs> moderating the, uh, the panel with our, with our colleagues from uh, other universities. So um, why do we care about circularity, right? Um, well, if we look at what's happening in terms of society, and we see that we've got increased um, uh, consumption. We've got a growing middle class, increased demand for improved economic development, out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and regenerating natural systems. So if you think about um, the linear, it's the take, make, dispose of, right, model. And when you look at circularity, you're trying to bring it back into, um, uh, into the cycle. So just to give you some, uh, well, first, and this is actually a very lucrative <coughs> way to think about it, since we're in business school, got to bring in the business angle, right? Accenture has done an analysis of all the different types of circularity and where the money lies, looking at monetizing wasted capacity like Uber or Airbnb, 600 billion, looking at marketing life cycle services, um, 900 billion, looking at, um, uh, so there you know you might think of rent the runway, right? 1300 billion for increasing recycling and upcycling um, and substituting wasted resources, renewable energy, green chemistry, bio-based fuel, and so on. So a couple of quick examples. Uh, Loop just announced 24 consumer packaged goods companies that have said, we want to tackle the challenge of single-use um, uh, packaging. And so they've reincarnated the milkman idea. So basically, you can order your products from these 24 companies that include Unilever, Pulsico, um, and others. They have designed a long-life uh, package that's beautiful, that you can use to have your detergent or whatever is in. And then when you're done, they'll, you'll send it back, just like the pay to dispose of them because they were toxic in landfill and, and, and doing it in a very uh, sustainable way or environmentally friendly way. But what they determined was they could actually bring those two byproducts together to create a bio-based fertilizer that they could then sell to the farmers who then, um, instead of using a nitrogen-based fertilizer, which uh, generates greenhouse gases, this is one of my favorite, and if you've been in my class, I always talk about this. This is a prototype. Now, 3D printed on demand uh, is not um, is is uh, not inflatable, so it lasts longer. The moss collects water, which makes the tire stickier on the road, so it's safer. The moss also eats carbon dioxide, generates oxygen. The AI, AI function in the hubcap controls how much water is in there and also talks to an autonomous vehicle, right? So met, really thinking circular, literally, <laughs> but also uh, in terms of all the different problems it's solving. And finally, as we think about the circular economy, um, this I find is a very useful schematic to think about where are those opportunities for um, refurbishing, reselling, remanufacturing, right? You know, in the extraction of the resource, how do you do, how do you have a regenerative approach? If you're looking at end of life, how do you refurbish it and bring it back into production? Or how do you resell it and put it back into the distribution system? Or in customer use, how do you restore repair? Right? So really interesting ways to think about things in a very different way in terms of systems and design thinking. So that's it for me. Um, I'll get over to Chris. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm really, really delighted to be here at our very first co-hosted event with the Center for Sustainable Business and Stern Business School, and uh, where are you going? Uh, and um, you know, we've been planning this for quite some time with Giuseppe and with the EU UN organization, with the Center for Sustainable Business, with the International Sustainable Development Research Society, who I'm going to introduce in just a minute. And so I'm very, uh, very happy, very excited to see all of you and to see this level of enthusiasm for, for really more than the, the food that we brought, um, <laughs> a little bit toward the circular economy. Um, there are a couple of brief remarks. What I, my job today is to sort of lay out where we would like you to be 
after about another hour. So this is this is our goal. So first we want you to be full. So I think we're, we're doing okay on that one. Uh, the second thing we want you to do is to start to see this as a place where you can see yourselves. You can see yourself being a part of this sort of movement towards circularity in, in trying to manage our resources, which are quite limited. Uh, and, and also to think about it in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. As you know, the Sustainable Development Goals were ratified by every country in the world in 2015. They're holistic. There are 17 of them. They're highly in increase uh, to improve public health outcomes, to reduce poverty, to improve the land and the soil use to address climate change. It's not going to happen unless we start to look at something that Professor uh, Whalen just laid out for you. Uh, and in fact, I would say it's not that it's something we strive to do with the circular economy, it's inevitable. And it's something that we have to get behind because there's no other way to achieve sustainable development otherwise, given the, the lack of resources, the relative lack of resources, and the fact that there are ways to address that in a sustainable way. So my job for you today is to get you excited about that, to see your place in it, to see that this is a place where if you're at the business school, you could make a career in it. It's a way that you could probably end up making a fair amount of money and also improve outcomes if you're a public health student. It's a way of looking at trying to uh, um, allocate resources more efficiently so that you don't waste a lot of resources to try to improve public health outcomes. Uh, if you're in a policy group, there are lots of other ways to get you involved, but our goal is to try to let you see yourself as being part of this today. Uh, my second goal, our second goal, is to introduce you to the great work that the International Sustainable Development Research Society is doing, and I'll let them introduce themselves, but if nothing else, I'd like you to be able to see that there are a number of very skilled researchers working together around the globe in, a, in kind of a coordinated way to try to address some of these sustainability questions, but they're also working a lot in using a systems approach, they're working a lot in resilience, they're working a lot in under uh, disadvantaged communities, so I think this is a great organization that I'd like us at NYU to be aware of and to think about collaborating with. And that's it, that's, those are my, the three goals really for us today. So I'd like to hand it over to Pauline Deutz, who's the, uh, the director of the International Sustainable Development Research Society. You have one already? Okay, good. And, uh, I'd just like to say thank you to Snart Office, to all of you for coming today. It's fantastic to see so many of you turn out for these uh, presentations. I'd like to say a big thank you to Giuseppe Sergi, who's organized the event, to Tanzi and Chris for hosting us. Uh, but without further ado, because time is present, I will move into that presentation. So I do have the pleasure at the minute to be the president of the International Sustainable Development Research Society. So I'll start by just telling you a little bit about that before going into talk more about my research. So it is a global organization. It's an academic society, but very much open to policy makers and business and practitioners as well. Uh, because if you're here working together with people from different backgrounds and in different strands of business, let's say parts of the economy, is essential in order to increase sustainability, however you might like to see that happen. Uh, we have people who are members of the society from all levels, to students, up to the senior professors. I'm somewhere in between, I would say. You're very welcome to visit our website. You can sign on as a follower, which is free, and then you'll get our newsletter and find out a bit more about the types of things that we do. Now, one of the major things that we do is organize a conference each year. Peter will say more about this towards the ambitious conference in Nanjing in China. So we're all very excited about the prospect of visiting China in just a few months' time. So something else I would like to tell you about, uh, which is a project that um, we're all part of in, in different ways. That's funded by the European Union, and it's looking at the sustainability of the circular economy. Now, I mentioned this partly to save time, because we'll all be referring to it as sort of as we go along. But it's also something that you might like to think about in the future. And here's opportunity for a funded PhD, three years of research, pays a very, very decent salary and lots of expenses as well to go and do interesting research, attend conferences and workshops. Our students spend a lot of time traveling, I would say. So look out for this type of opportunity in the years to come, whether it's circular economy or 
other types of fields, you, although it's funded by the European Union, the researchers can come from absolutely anywhere and they're very keen to see international uh, collaboration. So it, it's a Marie Swadowska Curie Innovative Training Network and I won't say more about it because you can see it there. Uh, in particular, you'll hear from me about Work Package 4 as the type of research that I do. Thomas will be talking more about uh, Public Sector Work Package 3 and Roberta's project fits into Work Package 5. So you'll hear quite a lot about this uh, as we go through. And you can see many other universities, including in China and Nigeria, <coughs> representing in this project. Here we all are meeting in Hull, outside the deep Hull Submarium, with our now pet shark booming over our heads. But a friendly shark, and good vibes only coming on that day. So, what is a circular economy? Well, here we'll see whether we, we all agree. At the last count, there are at least 114 different definitions of what a circular economy is. And I'm not going to go through those now because I feel that wouldn't be the most interesting approach. But this is one in particular that I like. It is the European Union definition. So, the circular economy is about managing resources. It's about extracting the maximum value and benefit from the products and the materials that they're composed of. So we make them last for as long as possible and we minimize the amount of waste generated. So in some ways this is quite a narrow <coughs> definition all about resource management, illustrated there by a little logo from the Waste Resources Action Program, which is part of the UK government's effort to initially build a demand for recycled materials, so helping businesses to make the circular economy work. And, oh, I have problems with that diagram. There are said to be 10 R's of the circular economy, 10 different ways, which conveniently, at least in English, you can contrive words that all begin with R that represent different actions that you can take, which could be repair, reuse, recycle, remanufacture, many different uh, approaches, which I mentioned just to give you an idea of the types of activities uh, that we're referring to, but also very usefully uh, outlined by Tanti earlier. What I would like to emphasize is that design is critical. This isn't just mopping up after we've bought things and decided what can we do with this packaging or this toaster that no longer works. It's about thinking about what's going to happen when they're designed. So they're designed with the idea of how can we make this last longer, or even, even if it lasts quite a long time, eventually we'll need to do something else with it. We need to design it in a way that minimizes the environmental impact at the end of life. So yes, we've got to, this, there will always be end of life of products. We're not going to make them to last forever. So we've got to bear that in mind. But there are also other ideas. I think this was touched on earlier when Uber was mentioned the idea of a sharing economy. Can we change our attitudes towards ownership? So we don't buy things, use them, and then get tired of them. We kind of just use them when we need them, then someone else uses them. And there's sort of economic models that you could come up with that might uh, help to make that function. So many different aspects of a circular economy. And a very popular definition from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Ellen MacArthur, sailed around the world single-handedly some years ago now. I think she was only something like 22 when she did it, quite impressive uh, achievement. She had a lot of time on her hands, and while she was doing that, she thought about how could we make the world more sustainable, how can we save energy resources, and so forth. She was just on a little boat, so she had to do all these things in quite a spectacular way. Uh, so what she's proposing here is a much more far-reaching change to society. Can we make the economy self-sustaining <coughs> in some ways? And much more ambitious than the European approach, the European Union official approach, which is just focusing on uh, resources. So I just want to talk very briefly about what's happening in the UK uh, around the circular economy. Um, some rather dull figures, probably, but actually they're telling on the whole a positive story that in terms of the targets that we have been set by the European Union for recycling household waste, for keeping viable waste out of landfill because it gives us methane that contributes to uh, climate change, and all these things are actually slightly ahead of its targets. And we've done very well over the last 10, 15 years. There's been a radical change of attitudes of local authorities have managed to work out how to put in recycling schemes, but many, not all people, will actually participate in. So we've gone from being one of the lowest recyclers in Europe to, I won't say one of the highest, but certainly 
meeting the target. But this has been partly done, not so very circular, by burning things and capturing energy, so there's a reliance on energy for waste. Um, if I made a graph to show this, instead of giving you the biggest, you'd see that how we're kind of reaching the limit. So there's a very quick increase, great <coughs> achievements, increasing recycling rates, but for the last five or six years, they've hardly increased anymore. We need to try something more radical now to break through that 50% recycling barrier to something more ambitious. So just before Christmas, the Waste and Resources Strategy came out, which explicitly refers to Ellen MacArthur and I don't think we're trying to achieve exactly what she says, but it, it's buying into that image of the circular economy. So very ambitious, eliminate avoidable waste by 2050. You'd have to ask, of course, what you mean by that, how are you going to achieve it? That part's not so very detailed, but there's some ambitious plans in mind. I also already mentioned the Waste Resources Action Programme. Many large companies have signed up to their plastic pack to help eliminate single-use plastics. Why? Well, partly because of this man, who some of you might recognise as Sir David Attenborough, has been presenting wildlife shows on TV for longer than I've been around, which is long enough. Um, most of that time he just focused on the animals, aren't they nice looking, attractive, this is how they behave, forgetting people. In the last few years he's got more interested in people and what people's impact on the environment is. So he's kind of changed his tune, he's got being more neutral and, uh, well, put his uh, cards in the open, let's say, and made a plea that we do more to help the environment. So David Attenborough says that plastics are a problem. Suddenly everyone recognised that and the UK government and Malta was a collecting to put money into trying to do uh, something about it. And a high level of interest from companies to take action because they feel like they have to or they feel like it would be good to be seen like they feel like they have to, etc. So part of the money that's going around here, I'm proud to say, has come from the University of Hull. So we're one of eight universities that have been given essentially a million pounds to do as much as we can to help plastics over the next 18 months, which is quite a, a stiff challenge, actually. Um, I won't dwell on that, but just to show you the type of approach that we've got. Here's some plastics. We know what it looks like, but this river, I have to say, is in Los Angeles. So maybe that's equidistant here to England. Uh, we're working with state companies. So there's about 20 companies, organizations, supermarkets, manufacturers, distributors, people who make dispose of packaging, who are working with us to discuss their issues and see if we can find solutions that will work for, if not all of them at the same time, many of them at the same time. There are chemists involved who are working in the laboratory to make new types of biodegradable plastics from bio materials. The question is, what does biodegradable mean? Some people need their plastics to biodegrade very quickly, for others that will be rather inconvenient. It needs to last maybe weeks or months, but at the minute, so-called biodegradable plastic often lasts for decades, if not centuries. So we can kind of move away from that sort of not really biodegradable to something that more genuinely is. There are also chemical engineers involved who are looking at imaginative solutions for the waste plastic that's already around us today. There's plenty of plastic around that we need to deal with that is not biodegradable at present. They can detoxify it, they can polymerize it so that you can essentially <coughs> start again. Very importantly, we're all talking to each other so that the solutions we come up to might have a greater chance of being implemented than if we were all working uh, in isolation. <coughs> so that's one project that uh, relates to circular economy that I'm involved in at Hull, and this is, uh, even more briefly, uh, a second one. Looking at this very economy, really sustainable. So if we define sustainability according to three pillars. It's got to be environmental, economic and social at the same time. Never an easy thing to achieve. Now of course we have the 17 sustainable <coughs> development goals. We've only did 169 different objectives, even more difficult to balance those, I would say. The circular economy has been argued to going a long way towards implementing the sustainable development goals, but there's very little evidence to that they get, which isn't surprising because and the Sustainable Development Goals are relatively new. Uh, but there are some <coughs> prospects, let's say, depending on how the implementation works out. All of the uh, goals that I've listed there are probably the ones that are the most relevant to the uh, circular economy. And the project that I'm involved in is probably 
I would say focusing on those ones there, which I've now covered up. I can't see what they are. So there's a design for the number eight decent work, ten reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production. So we are trying to focus on the social issues, which are often the ones are that are neglected. So very, very quickly, these are the four projects that Hull is involved in related to this. So there's Aidan Newsom, who's from Ireland. He's looking at how can individual places, using Hull as an example, benefit from the efficiencies that companies might get from circular activities when those companies are part of global supply chains. So what are the chances of the economic benefits actually sticking in Hull, or will they be distributed around the other part of the company? Santiago Perez from Colombia, based at the University of Technology Square in France, he's looking at efforts to build a company based around the port of Strasbourg in France, working with different stakeholders to see how what the systems of circularity are like, building those collaborations on a regional scale. Two more, there's Heather Rogers from Canada, who's looking at employment in the circular economy? What types of skills are involved? Do they happen to match the skills of people in Hull who are unemployed, for example? Hull's actually quite a deprived city. It could desperately do with some of these middle skilled jobs that the circular economy is said to provide. But will they appear? Will people want to do them if they do? So that is what she's looking at. And Malga Zata from Lacan from Poland is looking at how what's called the alternative economy can play a part in the circular economy. So she's working with a charity in Hull that redistributes waste food from supermarkets, so at or near its sell-by date, uh, and sells it at whatever local people can afford to buy. And there are sort of large communities in Hull which are simply food deserts. There's no affordable shopping within walking distance, but this charity is trying to provide this food to them. How does that fit into the bigger picture of the circular economy? So to conclude, how sustainable is the circular economy? We don't know yet, far too soon to tell. But policy and practice so far have been driven more by environmental and economic considerations than social. Hopefully the research that we're doing into the social areas will provide some useful insights that can help to direct things in the future. Yes, I'm always Thank you very much. Speaker is Roberto Salamon, who's professor in the Department of Economics at Messina University. University of Messina. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you to, for the organization. I'm really happy to be here to share with you some of the uh, first uh, issues connected to the research in, with the interesting project. Uh, I'm going to share with you some reflection about the role of life cycle assessment in a measuring circular economy. I will jump, uh, the definition of circular economy has been already given, so I will jump to the next slides. Uh, and uh, uh, to highlight that there are three um, level, three perspective in uh, implementing circular economy. That is the macro level, the meso level, and the micro level. At the macro level, uh, we are fo um, the focus is on country, national, and global uh, system, and uh, <coughs> the focus in, is in promoting sustainable production and consumption activities through design and uh, implementation of proper public policies. At the meso level, uh, the focus is on. Uh, um, industrial symbiosis initiative and uh, uh, eco-industrial parks, so closing resource loops by uh, encouraging energy cascading, uh, exchanging of byproducts, <coughs> recycling waste. At the macro level, the focus is on product and uh, organization, and uh, uh, the aim is to reduce resource consumption, reduce pollution, uh, design greener products, introduce new, uh, new uh, modes of consumption. Uh, some authors also add a fourth level of uh, 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 analysis. 
as the uh, uh, lower uh, level of uh, uh, has been uh, uh, observed as a key barrier to the uh, uh, circular economy. Uh, again, uh, with the different levels, we can observe that at the macro level, the metrics are mainly based on material <laughs> flow analysis. At the meso level, uh, uh, metrics mainly based on material flow analysis, system flow analysis, life cycle assessment, supply chain analysis. At the macro level, uh, there is still a chaotic uh, uh, situation and many different interpretations, even if uh, in literature we find a plethora of indicators at macro level and meso level and few indicators are suggested at the micro level. Uh, and anyway, uh, now uh, we uh, are working on a continuous uh, update of the literature at the micro level. Uh, we can uh, highlight that uh, uh, there are no official and recognized indicators at the micro level, and uh, there is still disagreement uh, on many issues. For example, there is this extended agreement on the methods of measurement. Many authors suggest to use a single indicator because it's easier uh, to be communicated, it's simpler to be uh, assessed. Uh, here, for example, there is the metric suggested by the UL 3600. Uh, anyhow, other others uh, uh, criticize the use of a single indicator because a single indicator is not able to uh, describe the complexity of circular economy. And for this reason, suggest to use tailored framework that generally uh, uh, are an integration of different indicators and different methods. There is still disagreement also on the metric. Most of the circular uh, uh, indicators uh, uh, suggested in literature are focused on physical flows, neglecting the economic dimension. Others suggest to use uh, 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 mainly uh, an economic value, an economic metric, uh, uh, supporting the theory that companies want to uh, improve their business with circularity, and so they are mainly interested in having an economic metric. But um, many others suggest to be uh, to, uh, to be cautious in using all of, all of the uh, an economic value and economic metric because. Uh, uh, producer will be tempted to choose always the cheapest solution, but we are not sure that the cheapest solution is the best option from an environmental point of view. And for the reason, we can find in literature some uh, metrics that try to combine different dimensions, mainly the environmental with the economic one, the environmental with the social one, some attempt to have an uh, uh, integration of the three dimensions, like, for example, the life cycle sustainability assessment. We can find also tentative to measure the uh, uh, circularity with qualitative, with a qualitative metric. In this case, uh, as in this example, uh, uh, in general, we are talking about uh, score uh, uh, tools, a questionnaire based on uh, a point-based questionnaire. There is still disagreement also on the object of measurement. Most of the metrics are based on, are focused on a product dimension. Uh, some of these, uh, uh, as for example the material circularity indicator suggested by the LMCAP to foundation can be also uh, applied to a company level, to a level, uh, on a level organization of uh, or an organization. Uh, what is certain is that uh, the, uh, a circular economy metric must have a broader perspective than a single focus on a single manufacturing phase in order to avoid a sh the shifting of a problem uh, to a phase, uh, from a phase to another. Uh, there is still disagreement also on the key elements, the basic principle that a circularity metric should have. For example, here in this table, 
I uh, put together the uh, 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 quality uh, uh, characteristic that uh, uh, a circular economy metric should have according to Linder and others, and the, the uh, seven recommendations made by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. As, as you can see in the first one, construct validity. They uh, uh, suggest to measure only circularity, that means uh, the traction of the new products that come from usage product. On the other side, we found that uh, company should, the metric should allow company to, to identify, to uh, uh, find uh, improvement options, not circularity itself. So as you can see, it's still disagreement. So, uh, in summary, there is a lack of uh, uh, consensus about metrics and methodologies uh, that hinders, uh, for example, the comparison between different companies within different sectors and also uh, within uh, products. Uh, in general, we uh, can uh, say that the metric uh, uh, is uh, uh, generally uh, oriented to have uh, a, a, a rapid overview of the circularity itself. Uh, and uh, the suggested metric uh, not deliver practical and operational guidance uh, to uh, uh, the uh, decision making process. But one of the first reflections that I want to uh, uh, share with you is uh, uh, that one. Uh, probably monitoring a circular economy strategies cannot be limited only on developing a metric on closing, narrowing, and uh, slowing the loads. We should uh, try to answer also to other questions. For example, if the circular option uh, um, imply a higher consumption of water, of energy, uh, if imply an additional use of chemicals, is imply an additional transport activities, in general, we should answer to the question how this uh, circular option uh, impact the environment. And uh, we want to understand if life cycle assessment can give answers to these questions. Uh, indeed, in literature, many authors suggest that uh, uh, LCA is a suitable and proper tool to measure uh, sustainable uh, circularity because uh, uh, LCA allow us to prioritize different action because LCA uh, allow us to measure the environmental uh, performance of a circular option and then we can compare this option with other circular option or linear option because uh, uh, LCA, we can add to circular indicator other LCA-based indicator that uh, widen our pitch, the picture of our option. And these indicators are scientifically based, well known, are uh, standardized. And uh, LCA, allow us to identify improvement option, environmental improvement option, uh, uh, that obviously could also, uh, may, could happen that the, the improvement option from an environmental point of view uh, do not imply circularity. On the other side, we have uh, authors that uh, think that the ESCA is not the proper tool to measure circularity. Why? Because it requires an extensive amount of data, because it's time consuming uh, if we compare it to other circular metrics, uh, because uh, its results uh, uh, require an expert audience, and generally companies want to communicate with consumers that are not an expert audience. Because LCA uh, um, refer only to the environmental dimension neglecting the economic and the social one. And finally, it doesn't tell us if a product is circular or not. That is the main question. 
So trying to understand this uh, 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 negative uh, aspect, this criticality, we are actually uh, comparing our previous LCA studies results uh, with some of the most common circular uh, metrics, circular indicators. In particular, we uh, uh, are comparing the material circularity indicator and the material reutilization scores with uh, uh, some uh, LCA-based indicators. Here today I will uh, briefly give uh, an example of two studies that we performed about packaging materials and about food waste strategy, uh, food waste uh, treatment. The first example is uh, uh, a packaging uh, for extra virgin olive oil, an Italian extra virgin olive oil. Uh, we compared a glass bottle uh, with a PET bottle. Uh, uh, the analysis include also secondary and tertiary packaging. We uh, uh, calculated the two indicators. MCI range from zero for a linear product to one for a circular product. MRS uh, range from zero to 100. Uh, in this case, uh, we found that for both the uh, indi circular indicator, the um, most circular option is the glass bottle. But if we consider an LCA indicator, such as, for example, the global warming potential in particular category, we will find that the best option is the PET bottle. Obviously, in the life cycle, we are considering the life cycle of the, the bottle from the extraction of raw material to processing and uh, transport and end of life. And uh, we also, if we add another LCA uh, indicator based, uh, we have the cumulative average agent demand. Uh, also, in this case, uh, the best option is the pet bottle. We choose this indicator because they are suggested by the LM Capital Foundation as to be added to the MCI. So there is a trade-off. What can a company? How can a company uh, uh, continue the decision-making process? The other example is uh, uh, the treatment of food waste. We compared two different scenarios. One scenario is the, the anaerobic digestion that allow us to obtain from organic waste, biogas, and compost. The other is the bioconversion using Hermes illusions, uh, an for the side that allow to uh, have a, biologic, a biodegradation of organic uh, uh, waste in order to obtain dry lard that can, that can be used as a source of protein to produce feed and fa, uh, fa, or, fat, or fat to produce biodiesel and compost. In this case, it was not possible to uh, calculate the MCI because we are in the biological cycle and the uh, MCI can be <coughs> calculated only in the technical cycle. Uh, the MRS being the organic waste, 100% recyclable and 100% recycled, in uh, uh, both the cases, the indicator is the same. So it is not possible to um, make a comparison. With LCA, it's possible to make a comparison. And we are also trying to understand if we can also measure circularity. Because I, I don't know if you uh, are expert of LCA, but in LCA, we can insert uh, the avoided production. That it means the credit in the life cycle inventory, the credit associated to the impact to the environmental loads of the product that we are, the conventional product that we are substituting with the recycling one. <coughs> so my conclusion is just to give some, to share some reflection with you. Uh, we do not make, uh, have to make confusion between what we are searching for. How circular, uh, if we are, uh, the answer is how circular a product is, we can use circular metric. If we want to understand which is the impact of a circular product, we should use, for example, LCA. But are we sure that we want to measure and communicate only the circularity? 
is this uh, the only metric that you want to communicate? What happens if a circular option is unsafe, is unhealthy, is polluting? We need to add, in any case, other indicator. And LCA is a perfect indicator candidate to measure circular uh, economy metric because the criticalities that uh, I briefly presented before uh, can be uh, phased with an accurate modeling of the common scope, functioning unit, system boundaries, a uh, proper modeling of the life cycle uh, 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 inventory. We can add to LCA life cycle costing and social LCA to have a dimension of sustainability. And the extensive amount of data uh, is what company should have to contrast lack of information, confidence, and capability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just, um, unfortunately, we have to be out of here 120 sharp, so I just want to remind our speakers to keep on our time frame here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Thomas Zranis from Nova University of Lisbon and, and also a member of the board of the International Sustainable Development Research Society. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for organizing all this uh, section. Um, in this presentation, uh, I will mainly discuss another angle of the related with circular economy. So uh, I will present two, at least two, two, two dimensions brief, briefly, uh, some a couple of examples uh, of circular economy in, in Portugal in the Portuguese context. So the presentation will be mainly divided uh, in the brief introduction. So the current trends of circular economy policies and practices in this kind of organization, so in public sector organizations, they are different. Um, so and after that, uh, some few examples of the, the practices implemented in Portugal, uh, and some final remarks. So public sector, public sector organizations, they are different. So they have a different role. Um, they are they have they are under government control and so they develop public goods and services and the main difference I think we can say uh, is the political nature of these organizations. So they produce services, they produce regulations, political actions, and so they enable society to function. So they have a direct rule and a strong rule uh, with a variety of, of actors and economic activities. And in fact, given their size and influence in the society and then, and then also in the, all the economic models, they have uh, an, an important uh, and leading role in this context related with sustainability, but also related with, with circular economy. So, we expect that they could lead, in fact, some of the transitions to circular economy. And of course, related with this are the SDGs, again. So circular economy, public sector, and SDGs. And public sector should have, and for sure that will have, and will play a central role uh, linking SDGs and circular economy. And an interesting point also that we should mention here is the difference between private, well, the business sector and the public sector. And in fact, we know, we already know that we have a, well, a relevant amount uh, of research work on circular economy practices and initiatives in, in the business sector. Uh, and the public sector, uh, on the other side, um, have been left out mainly of the scope of these studies. So they are following the, the, the business sector, but in, 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 with the slower with slower signs. So, the fact is there is a huge lack of research and knowledge uh, on how public sector organizations are adopting adopting these circular economy transitions and circular economy actions uh, at different levels. So at policy level, strategic level and also at operational level uh, and in the housekeeping operations in their own uh, organization. So two things that we want and that probably we want to know in the, in the next years will be how these changes are impacting um, 
their own performance, and, and really important, this one, how they are impacting the business sector. So integrated in the same project that, uh, that was already mentioned, the Cresting project funded by the European Commission, Cresting project, uh, trying to analyze three different angles related to the public sector and supply kind. Uh, the first one is to the, and to identify the circular economy initiatives and approaches, uh, approaches already adopted by public sector organizations at the different levels, so the strategic level and the operational level, uh, analyze how these organizations, so how public sector organizations are impacting business sector, and finally, we will try to analyze and, and propose a kind of uh, evaluation approach to evaluate circularity in these organizations. So how, evaluate, how to evaluate circular economy in public sector organizations, so through an indicator approach. So this is, will be mainly conducted in two PhD theses. Uh, um, they are, these two uh, persons are settled in Lisbon in collaboration with, with, with two universities in Hull uh, and also in Italy with the University of Pescara to cover these two gaps, or two main gaps, particular kind of policy in public sector organization. So, in fact, we we know that this kind of, the, the, the amount of work that we know about these organizations are very much related with sustainability in the broad sense. So, related with sustainability, public procurement, reporting, auditing, awards, well, sustainability management systems, that this kind of material. And we know <laughs> that the majority of these works do not have a specific focus on circular economy. So they are, they are, they are really important and, and of course they are focused on sustainability and SDGs and so on, but the link with circular economy is not there. So the, there is a lack, a significant lack uh, in, to, in, in this link. Uh, of course there are some, a couple of initiatives related with pu public procurement and circular economy or the, with the digital government platforms, so related again with circular economy, but it's, it's weak. So, to conclude this, this point here, we know that public sector should be a supporter of circular economy, but we also know that should be an active player uh, in this game. So, regarding some, well, Portugal as an example of what is being conducted uh, at European level. Uh, well, three examples. The national plan. Uh, well, of course, it's not only in Portugal, but in France and many other countries at European level. But so, uh, the, the national, the Portuguese national plan is the a, a national plan focused on circular economy. It is mainly divided in strategic actions, as we have here, uh, macro level and uh, meso level, covering almost everything. And that's probably a problem. Uh, it's kind of a sustainable development strategy, but with the name of circular economy. Uh, and that's my point here that I, I would like to discuss with you. So this is an ice plan, in fact, uh, well, very ambitious, you know, for the next, for this period, 2017, 2020. But in fact, in my view, there is a huge risk of overlapping and confusion between this plan and other plans are, uh, related with sustainable development goals, with sustainability, including the national sustainable, uh, the national sustainable development strategy. And we should, we must clarify this confusion. So, and, and also the plan is quite complex. I mean, if, if I need to implement that plan, I, I'll have some problems. And in fact, in fact, part of the problem is related with the, with the, um, the lack of uh, evaluation prior to the implementation. So it's a fundamental thing to evaluate the, the possible or the potential impacts of this kind of instrument. And that evaluation was not conducted. And finally, uh, a word for the monitoring scheme. Uh, in my, well, they have some indicators to monitor the plan. So they monitor the circular economy implemented at national level and including regional and local. But in my view, it's quite weak. The other example is the national web portal for circling. So including guidelines, resources, links, data. Examples of good practices by the, all the sectors, banking, uh, construction, uh, construction, agriculture, and so on. So you can filter 
uh, what you what you need, um, and also opportunities for, for the business, so for, for the business sector. So corporate funding opportunities, awards, project calls, and so on, including a part for events and training and so on. So I think this is a really good example of. I think I'm afraid it's only in Portuguese, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the plan is in English. But anyway, uh, I can help with that part. Um, so then some pictures from this website, just to show you the information that you can use there. And finally, to conclude, um, the last, the, 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 the third example uh, of what is being conducted in Portugal uh, is, that is related with the funding scheme. The, 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 the Portuguese Ministry of the Environment uh, is in charge of um, managing this funding scheme uh, and this funding scheme is mainly uh, wants to support initiatives uh, targets on circular economy uh, for the public sector. Uh, so the public sector has a central role here in this funding scheme, including uh, the uh, solutions for parish and parish councils and also projects in circular economy procurement activities. So there are funding opportunities for these two uh, two areas here. So again, is also a, a good example in my view of how to promote this circular economy in public sector. And that's it. Thanks for you very much. For your time. There are possibly four reasons why I am in academia. First and foremost is the reason that I get to meet such ambitious students like you. Second, it's fun and rewarding. Third, I love it as a scholar to be quoted and uh, cited when someone actually reads and cites what I'm writing. And fourth, um, when you are actually getting right when you have written something. This article from 1999 is an example of the latter, that we were actually right of what was happening 20 years later. And I would like to illustrate that and challenge you with a thought. Okay, so in this article we have two scenarios. One, eco-efficiency, an old term of a pre a circular economy, a business as usual, linear thinking, that kind of stuff. The second one, dematerialization, is more into a circular economy, radical change, not incremental change, but big, huge steps. The innovative kind of thinking that I hope that you will be part of. We did that in recycling industries, in automobile industry, and the household appliances. Regarding the automobile industries, I wanted to show you many nice quotes, but I'm just referring to maybe one or two. Instead of producing cars, and this was in Sweden, Volvo, Sweden, in that. And there are more quotes like that. So if you're interested, I can send you the article. You have an email at the last slide. I can uh, provide that for you, no charge. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, and now I'm actually gonna go forward a few slides where you come into the situation is that when we realize where we are today, we are, have, at least in Europe, the car should go. That's car rental minute by minute. We have Sunfleet in Sweden, which is funded by and backed up by Volvo. It shared car fleet with monthly fees. We have care by Volvo subscription. Actually, the first way of subscribing to a car, not owning the car. We have Uber, Cabify, Captain, bzz, which is uh, electric <laughs> taxi pods in Stockholm, by which you also pay like four cents uh, a, a kilometer, not four cents a kilometer, four cents a minute or something, whatever, but that's what you do. And that was also something that we wrote in the article. We need to have electric cars on the roads. We also have electrical scooters. This is not automobile, but electrical scooters being easily to rent. And we also have city bike, like you have in New York. City bikes, and why is it that a city bank is actually getting into market 
for physical things. They are doing, doing the reworks. They are going from financial services to products like a city bike. Of course, not us owning it, but instead us renting it. Someone before me, Pauline, said we are living into a, a coming into a sharing economy. I don't own a car. I'm a father of four, but I don't own a car. We take the train ride to you. We don't need to own a car. So, where are we in 20 years now? This article was an example of what we could see and tell what would happen in 19 or in 2019. Where are we? Where are you in 20 years when you are considering and reconsidering the circular, circular economy and all the concepts that are, belongs to that? So, that was basically the short version of <laughs> <laughs> What, what do you think will be? These are the brightest signs in all of New York and maybe beyond. Where do you think will be if we're going to be moving toward this circular coming in 20 years from now? Well, I think the progress will be much more cheaper now because of the reasons being more awareness <coughs> across the world. Uh, you all know, understand the importance of it, the, the, the environmental hazard that we are facing and how it can impact the existence of the human being and the entire civilization. So I think the awareness is there. People are uh, really uh, focused on working towards it. And second thing, there is a lot of information and research and uh, sort of data and analytics which is working with intelligence and all these things are really helping them drive this, drive this forward. Do you think uh, do you think maybe we'll get better at using at finding more resources to keep validating the linear economy, or do you think we're going to inevitably move toward what our speakers have? Uh, I think we'll be moving more towards what we are trying to. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that the consent in the room, or do you uh, go ahead? Tim. So I, I think that twenty years from now, it would be a detriment to you know still subscribe to the linear economy. It, it has to become necessary for people, for us to move towards the um, circular economy because, I mean, <clears throat> even looking at environmental pollution, climate waste, these are things that are now necessary to address. It's not an option to just be like, oh, you know, I could either be linear or secular. That has to be the way things go. And also when we think about resources, the fact that most of the resources we use are not as you know, they're not as replaceable or renewable as we um, need to think. And thinking about resource limitations, especially, I mean, I come from a uh, low and middle income country, I'm from Nigeria, and one big thing is even by the classification of being an LMIC versus a um, high income country, it's really about how much resources you have. And we end up, we're not just talking about money, we're talking about capital, human resources, training. So it is, essential is it is a necessity for a lot of the world and in 20 years from now i think everyone would just the way we own things now would become a tax to own things that we do now but it may not be without pain right because all of the presentations we saw require some investment some engineering some re-engineering some willingness to take some risks and you know you have to maybe get a little bit of an appetite toward that. Does anybody else want to suggest a... Yes, MD. Uh, right now, uh, from the presentation and from the global health perspective, my question is that what are the indicators? The indicators are missing, and we all are struggling to find how would we, how would you find the indicators? And in 20 years, as you mentioned, progress, and I think that's a notion that is very attractive, but there are also consequences that at what point we think it's enough uh, progress. Or if we are doing progress, then there is also vacuum you're creating. So I think in 20 years, we're going to have integrated economy. Some economies, they need to, it's, it's a little more than share. Not only people will use it when they need to, but they will also give even when they still need it. So there will be integration like that. And then the smaller economies, they will sort of provide the indicators for bigger economies. They will give, it's kind of like the feedback that in public health we learn. So they will give those indicators. In 20 years, I think through shared economy, we will have some level of understanding of indicators. Can I ask, are there any Stern students in the room? 
How do you how do you incorporate this kind of thinking in your coursework currently? Is it all finance and strategy and accounting, or are you looking at sustainable business models? And how are you incorporating that? Say you're not. <laughs> we have one here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm actually a freshman, um, a term student. Um, and yeah, Business and Society is our curriculum. Okay. Um, that's a great class. Very excited to be a part of it. Um, but yeah, I would say we are very, uh, it's a budding program. Uh, a lot of co curriculars and fellow program. Um, so I think they're. I'm excited to be part of a huge group of people. But how do you deal with the tension? You know, you're here at one of the top business schools in the whole world. And so every year when, when all of you graduate, the companies are pulling up and, and, and excited to be able to hire you and into investment banks, into consulting firms, into multinationals, into some really lucrative ways of making a living. How can you balance that with this idea that we're going to have to take some risk and possibly not show a return for some amount of time applying these wonderful skills that you have here. I really want to hear from a business school student, and then we'll come back to the public health. Go ahead, you're... Yeah, so um, it seems like from some of our classes, we've been learning that um, there's like a general consensus now in the business world that not only is um, enacting sustainable policies and just having a sustainable business model socially good, but it's also uh, reaping financial benefits as well. So you're seeing um, kind of a shift from like the traditional uh, shareholder business model to like a multiple stakeholder business model where you consider not only the interests of the shareholders, but for example, the interests of the, um, the environments of the of communities Double, as well. Triple bottom line. Exactly. And, and so it, it does seem like um, there's a lot of business leaders realizing that, <coughs> like I think I, I read a, it was the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, releases a letter to shareholders every every year. And he was talking about, I think the most recent letter was about how um, really having a sustainable business model and a sustainable mission is really the future of business. Again, it's not just uh, socially feasible, but it's actually financially feasible. So hopefully that's a growing trend and that we continue to see that. Do you think your classmates feel the same way? I would hope so, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, I saw a question over here. We have time for one more question, because we have to, we do have to bolt here in a couple of minutes. But let's take one more question. And Did you have a question? I didn't have a question. I was just going to say that I think that, um, to reach that point, that collaboration is really important, and having these types of um, conversations outside of strictly academia. And, you know, there was a point about talking to designers, about talking to economists and mathematicians, and also to consumers, and kind of pushing these points forward um, and making it so that companies do see the financial benefit in the future of responding to their consumers' wants and desires. But it has to be bigger than just in the academic space or in the urban space or in the kind of, like, what's popular in the minute space. So. Cool. So I'm not a business student, but I kind of dived into this world in the past six months, and it's been incredible. And I've been learning a lot about human-centered design. And I really think that's going to make or break this, if more companies start engaging in human-centered design. And I just wonder, from the panel... Does everybody know what human-centered design is? So it's really building something the way people are already behaving and trying to incorporate it into their current way of doing things and trying to impose something from above is a different behavior onto people. Go ahead. Right, thank you. So with that said, the reason I mentioned human-centered design is perhaps in the next 20 years, we will be that generation that says, as part of our daily life, this is important. Sustainability is part of our behaviors, and therefore you have to create a business that honors that. So with that said, for the panelists, do you feel that it's the responsibility of, of companies to push this forward, or perhaps new businesses like startups to really initiate this? You have two minutes. Yes. Yes. Together in parallel. Initiative with government. There are some wonderful businesses out there doing all sorts of innovative things, but the most businesses take a bit on target to be from a single bottom line to a double or a treble. It takes regulations to show companies which way they should go. So I think governments will have a very important job. I think 
we're counting on you. Yeah. We're, we're kind of at the other, we're on the downslope of our career curves. Yeah. So we put all of our eggs into your basket. This so you, you're the ones that we really, really are, uh, are counting on. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Yeah, so, uh, I just, oh, just wanted to thank our panel very much. Also to ask um, if maybe they can stay for a few minutes outside, so if you have extra questions for them outside the room. And also, can you please take all of your garbage out with you? Thank you very much. Yeah.